The next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 10898 <coughs> in the name of Jackson Carlow on Neilston and Uplamoor first responders reaching their 100th emergency call-out. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I now call on Jackson Carlow to open the debate. Mr Carlow, seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It's a genuine pleasure to propose and speak to the motion tabled in my name this afternoon, and I'm delighted to be able to do so as the work to which it pays tribute is vital, the support of other organisations for that work has been generous, spontaneous and heartfelt, and especially because the volunteers who have made all that has been achieved possible represent the very best of Scotland. And I know too there will be members who will be equally familiar with community first responder groups in their own areas. Indeed, there are some 100 schemes operating across Scotland with some 1,200 volunteer responders. But for those who are not, let me explain that community first responders are asked to attend serious and life-threatening emergencies such as breathing difficulties, chest pains, cardiac arrest or unconsciousness. It should be noted that they're not sent to road collisions or traumatic injuries or to anything out with their training. They are trained by the Scottish Ambulance Service in basic first aid and life-saving skills so that they can deliver a speedy, reassuring response to patients while an ambulance is on the way. And they are deployed to appropriate calls by the Scottish Ambulance Service Control Centre. Now, an emergency ambulance is always dispatched first, and the role of the responder is to support the patient while that ambulance is on its way, providing an important service that benefits the community, and which, importantly, the community itself recognises and appreciates is of benefit. Now, my motion is, I'm afraid, already somewhat out of date. It recognises the 100th call uh, of the Neilston and Uplandmoor responder group, as was the case when I first lodged it on September the 1st. However, by Tuesday this week, that figure had increased dramatically to 147 call-outs. And, presiding officer, perhaps with the assistance of any willing member, suitably overcome with excitement by remarks during the next few minutes, we might even push it over the 150 mark during the course of this debate. And this is all quite remarkable. However, the success of voluntary projects and initiatives is never guaranteed. It depends on leadership and the commitment and support of a great many people. In the case of Nielsen and Uplamour, this leadership has been ably provided by both Stuart McLennan and Ross Nelson, both of whom are in Parliament today. And I say again, as I had the pleasure earlier this year of welcoming and thanking personally a more extended team from the group here at Holyrood. Stuart McLennan gave the spark of life to this responder group in April last year, when, like others across Scotland, he approached the Scottish Ambulance Service. And the service then convened a meeting to test public interest and support, to which initially 15 people turned up willing to participate. Stuart recruited constantly throughout the year, and by November, a team was being trained, and then in January, with the appropriate approval secured, the group went live. Now, I've made mention of the support from others in the community, from the local hotel in Uplamoor, which cheerfully allowed meetings to take place free of charge in its premises, to St John's Scotland, which has supported the project in a number of ways to which I will return, and also to Arnold Clark, which has given such a boost to the responders with the donation of a uh, vehicle at the start, since renewed, and an even more with an even more appropriate vehicle last month. And I'm grateful to the managing director of Arnold Clark, Eddie Hawthorne, for his support and engagement. And perhaps, presiding officer, I might just add at this point and pay tribute to Sir Arnold Clark himself. Uh, and I'm happy that, that this will then find its place in the official record of Parliament. I've known him for many years, and such as his re reach and depth and length of service to the retail motor industry in Scotland and the UK over several generations, that I can, I can add that I know him as my father and my grandfather did before. He has built one of Scotland's most successful businesses, and he's been content not to posture on the wider stage, but I know there will be many community groups all over Scotland who will be indebted to him for the generous support he has offered personally and for the assistance which has been offered by his organisation, a branch of which cannot now be far removed from any Scottish community. Now, I made mention a moment ago also of the support of St John's Scotland. Less well known generally in Scotland than it deserves, St John's Scotland formed in 1947 and has as one of its main objects the encouragement and promotion of all work of humanity and charity for the relief of people in sickness, distress, suffering or danger. So this is a perfect fit. 
Now, what I have most enjoyed about their involvement is the enthusiasm this project has generated among their members, an infectious enthusiasm achieved by Stuart McClellan and Ross Nelson on the now several visits made to secure further funding, which has to date paid for a defibrillator, extensive training equipment, and most recently, uh, for the refurbishment of the former police station in Neilston as a permanent base after the group grew out of the generous provision of space offered by the Neilston Development Trust, yet another successfully locally based project. Now, I should note that this facility will be lost as a consequence of a change of ownership, but I'm in no doubt that Stuart and his team will identify and then set about securing and equipping an alternative base. That is, if the acquisition cost of 55,000 cannot yet be raised, uh, but knowing Stuart, I'm not certainly uh, going to rule that out. It's sometimes easy to talk in abstract terms about the mechanics of a voluntary group. What can sometimes get lost is the character and the dynamic and the public worth. When I've met up with the responders, as I have done now on several occasions, they've been full of buzz and fizz and enthusiasm, which is there for everyone to see. All the more so now, as from being a theoretical organization being established, they are attending call-outs across the community and helping to save lives. And the response of the community itself, as it begins to understand just what an advantage they have represented. This is not an initiative which in any way seeks to ameliorate ambulance arrival delays, far from it. It's the recognition that for most people, basic life-saving skills are simply not understood or practiced. The support of someone who can act immediately and ensure that the attendance of the Scottish Ambulance Service is all the more effective, efficient and successful is something which any of the individuals or families which have experienced it will not forget. Across Neilston and Uplamour, the appreciation of the public is palpable. Across Scotland, this will also be true. And hopefully yet elsewhere, communities will be fortunate enough to identify and enlist committed individuals and leadership and establish a first responder group with similar success. I'm actually sure the government and members of all parties will join me in congratulating this local first responder group, one of several in the west of Scotland regional constituency I represent, and of those groups that are represented and established elsewhere across Scotland all equally deserving our congratulation and support, and I'm delighted to formally move the motion in my name. Many thanks. I now call on John McAlpine to be followed by Hugh Henry. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I would like to congratulate Jackson Carlaw on securing this uh, very important debate on a very important subject. Uh, I had a look at the website of the Neilston and Uplaw Muir uh, First Responders Unit and I was very impressed with the numbers involved, all the more so after hearing from uh, Jackson Carlaw that the, the group has been in place for a relatively short period of time and has clearly achieved a great deal in that short period of time as have the, the many uh, hundreds of schemes or hundreds of schemes across Scotland uh, that have now been established and as Jackson Carlos says um, involving um, uh, 1,200 volunteers, which is extremely impressive. Now, I understand it was R Dr. Richard Cummings from Seattle in the USA who discovered in 1990 that if a series of interventions took place in a set sequence, a patient suffering from a heart attack stood a greater chance of survival. And these events are now known as the chain of survival. Community first responders are an integral and valued link in the chain of survival in areas that experience an extended journey time as they can provide essential simple treatments in those crucial first few moments. The sequence uh, is, is this. Uh, one, early recognition and call for help. Uh, two, early CPR. Three, early defibrillation, and four, early advanced care. Now, that might sound daunting, but full training is given, and all first responders will undergo IHCD, that's Institute of Healthcare and Development Training, uh, for first persons on the scene. Uh, this course has been devised in association with the Royal College of Surgeons. But these volunteers must also pass exams and get through a very rigorous selection process as well as pass the PVG. Uh, first responders must also update their skills continually with mon monthly training and they're advised to sign up for at least one call shift every week to ensure that the skills they acquire are put to practical use and don't atrophy. Uh, it's obvious that first responders require a great deal of commitment and the fact that they're volunteers makes that all the more admirable. They work as part of a team that, as Jackson Carlos says, they're not intended to replace ambulances or paramedics, but they do buy vital time. 
When a person has a sudden cardiac arrest, their heart's regular rhythm becomes chaotic or arrhythmic. And every minute that the heart is not beating lowers the odds of survival by 7 to 10%. Um, after 10 minutes without defibrillation, very few people survive. And, presiding officer, I'm, I'm very pleased to note that mortality due to heart attacks has declined significantly across the world since the 1970s. And the OECD attribute this in part to the introduction of treatments aimed at rapidly restoring coronary blood flow and the point that, pro that, that processes of care, such as these timely medical interventions, these play a big part in determining whether a person will live or die. Comparative figures show that countries with the highest attack heart attack survival rates include Denmark, New Zealand, Norway and Sweden and it's no coincidence that most of these countries have highly organised and long-standing uh, network of community first responders. Um, I'm very pleased that Scotland is uh, for some time now has been putting the experience of those other countries into effect with great success. Uh, first responders are on the front line of our community resilience plan that the Scottish Ambulance Service has put in place and covers the period 2011 to 2015. Because even when you do achieve the best ambulance response times in the world, there are conditions, as I've said, such as cardiac arrest and acute uh, hyperacute stroke where every second counts. Um, the Scottish Ambulance Service website lists the places where first responders are needed because clearly they need more volunteers. And the lists are actually quite long, um, certainly far too long for me to read out here, except to say that in my own region of the south of Scotland, there are 49 communities on the website re requiring uh, volunteer first responders. And these range from smaller places like Newcastleton and Port William to relatively large rural population centres like Peebles, Moffat and Delbiti. And I know that Moffat has a, a big group, which I believe um, has done 24-7 cover, which really is quite something. But even that group is still looking for for additional volunteers. It is clear um, that while I represent a rural area, you can see the, the benefits for first responders everywhere, and that's notable in the fact that both Glasgow Airport and Brayhead Shopping Centre are listed as uh, looking for additional volunteers. So once again, I'd like to congratulate Jackson Carlow on securing this debate and uh, congratulate his group and indeed all groups of first responders working across Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now call on Hugh Henry, after which we'll move to closing speech from the Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I want to thank Jackson Carlaw for giving the Scottish Parliament the opportunity to put on record our recognition and thanks of the work being done by the First Responder Scheme in Nielsen and Uplamour, which is in my constituency of Renfrewshire South. I think all too often across Scotland we, we, we can say that we know that the, the volunteers do tremendous work, but we actually don't sometimes take sufficient time to put that on record. And what Ross Nelson and Stuart McClelland and the, the, the team of volunteers have done in Nielsen and Up Lamour is, is something which is making a significant contribution to the lives of individuals in that community. Now, I don't think that they or anyone else would want to suggest for one moment that this scheme is a substitute for an effective and efficient ambulance service. But it can complement the work that our excellent ambulance service does, and it can make a difference in saving lives. I think it's also maybe putting this in the context of the communities of Nielsen and Uplamour, two very distinct communities, but actually very closely linked. Nielsen is the larger of those two communities. There is a, a long and proud community identification, community tradition and determination to work together for the benefit of all. Just last night I attended uh, an event in Nielsen to celebrate uh, the work in, of Pauline Gallagher in the Nielsen Development Trust and the fantastic contribution that she has made um, to the village of Nielsen, not just through the Development Trust but also the extension uh, to having uh, the community wind farm which is an example uh, to communities right across Scotland. I know that there are many people who are working hard to 
um, have a, a war memorial established in, in Nielsen, um, John Maguire of Phoenix Honda, but also a classmate of mine, Jimmy Higgins, um, walked to France last year to raise money for that war memorial. So we're talking about communities, two communities which are determined to do everything that they can to help each other. Now, Jackson Carlaw has eloquently outlined the role that these organisations uh, play increasingly across not just Scotland, Britain, but it's happening internationally. But I know that we can actually point to success from these schemes. I, I talked to my two Labour councillors who represent Nielsen, uh, councillor Elaine Green, whose daughter Jennifer is actually a volunteer with the first responders. And, and they've told me, you know, the fantastic work that has been done and the very human response. My, council, uh, my, my other council uh, colleague, Paul O'Kane, was telling me that, that one Sunday at Mass at St Thomas's in Nielsen, an elderly parishioner had taken on well, and it was really because of the rapid response from that team of volunteers that that person's condition was able to be stabilised in uh, advance of the ambulance, serv uh, the ambulance service arriving. So we have a, 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 a team of volunteers, a scheme here, that is making its mark on the local community. It has the support of the local community. The fact that you've got 30 or more people already prepared to give their time to something that they see of immediate benefit to themselves, their families, to their neighbours and friends. And, you know, Stuart and his team um, have, have had to work really hard to get the money, and Jackson Carlow has indicated some of the support that they've had. Um, they are now in, in temporary premises, hoping that they might just be able to, to get the finance to, to, to make that permanent. And it would be a real shame if a small amount of money was to prevent that skill base which has been developed from continuing to make its contribution to Nielsen and, and Uplamour. I know from, as I said, from talking to, to local people that they already value the service. They know that it's made a difference and they can point to the individuals whose lives um, have been helped by those volunteers. So I do hope that collectively we are all able not just to offer our warm words of support, but to identify ways in which we can help this fantastic service to continue. So once again, not just thanks to Jackson Carlow for en enabling us to debate this, but thanks to that team of terrific and tremendous volunteers that are really putting their mark on Nielsen and Uplamour. Thank you. And thank you. I now call on the Minister, Michael Matheson, to close the debate on behalf of the Government. Seven minutes or thereby, Minister, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I, uh, like others, begin by congratulating uh, Jackson Carlow on securing time for this debate and also to offer my uh, congratulations to the first responder team in uh, Nielsen and Uplaw Moore uh, for the tremendous work they have undertaken. As Jackson Carlow says, they have now uh, significantly surpassed their uh, 100th emergency call out and are now at 147, which I think is a, a remarkable uh, uh, amount of call outs given that they have been operating in the area for a, a relatively short period of time since January uh, of uh, this uh, year. And I'm sure that, as uh, all members will recognise, uh, there are a range of medical conditions where time is of the absolute essence in how we respond to that individual within our community in order to provide them with the best possible care uh, that we can. And conditions such as cardiac arrest, as we've heard from uh, Joan McAlpine, uh, are conditions where every second counts. And that's exactly uh, why uh, first, uh, community first responders uh, schemes are so important. I'm sure members will also uh, recognise that community first responders, I also think, send out a very strong message about the level of community resilience within our own individual communities and their desire to do the right thing for their own community and its uh, well-being. And it's important that we work to support them in undertaking that type of uh, work. There are uh, uh, presently 127 uh, first uh, uh, responder schemes across the country with uh, over 1,000 volunteers uh, involved in participating 
in the programme. Um, I want to take this opportunity, President Officer, to say uh, there is always uh, an opportunity to introduce more uh, of these community first responder uh, teams. I would like to encourage uh, any community that is considering the possibility of participating in this programme uh, to encourage them to do so in the same way in which the community in Nielsen and Uplomore uh, up have uh, responded uh, over the last year. And if they are uh, interested in doing so, the Scottish Ambulance Service uh, will be more than happy to assist them in providing the support necessary to set up the first responder uh, scheme within their own local area. Members will uh, also recognise that uh, the increasing number of uh, community first responder uh, programmes sits within a range of other work which we have been undertaking in order to improve uh, community resilience around uh, meeting the healthcare needs of our local communities. For example, we have got the community resuscitation development officers who uh, recruit and train uh, community members uh, to provide care. We have got the public access defibrillators in a range of locations, uh, which is also supported by local training programmes and awareness raising programmes. We have got the first aid awareness and training uh, that we provide uh, through schools uh, and also in the community at large. And of course, obviously, the, the community first responder programme itself. And this all sits within the wider context of trying to make sure that we improve the uh, health and well-being of the people of Scotland. Uh, members may have noticed last week that I announced that we would be taking forward uh, a strategy next year uh, which aims to cut the number of uh, deaths from out-of-hospital uh, cardiac arrest, a point which um, uh, Joan McAlpine made reference to in her own uh, contribution, because we know that uh, survival of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest depends on what is the chain of survival, uh, which we need to make sure uh, is as complete as possible uh, uh, in order to ensure that someone receives resuscitation uh, and defibrillation uh, when a cardiac arrest occurs. And our community first responder uh, teams are an important part of that chain within our local communities so that we can continue to reduce the number of people um, who die as a result of an out-of-hospital uh, cardiac arrest. This sits within uh, the wider work we have been doing around uh, increasing the number of publicly available defibrillators. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Health earlier this year uh, provided a further uh, £100,000 uh, to increase the number of publicly available uh, defibrillators. And also in August of this year, uh, I launched a new rollout of defibrillators being provided to our independent dental practices um, across uh, Scotland. Uh, these uh, defibrillators uh, are a crucial piece of uh, kit uh, that quite literally uh, save lives. And what they are now doing is mapping all of these on the uh, Scottish Ambulance Service uh, control system. Uh, so that means that if an emergency occurs near a dental practice area or one which is in a local shop uh, or uh, within a workplace or within a supermarket, as increasingly is the case, then they can be tasked uh, in order to uh, deploy that piece of kit. And that's uh, involved some £600,000 worth of investment, and we now have uh, approximately 815 dental practices who have signed up to uh, this uh, programme. This also sits alongside the work which we are doing with the British Heart Foundation, Heart Start programme uh, within our schools. Uh, almost 62 per cent of our secondary schools have now uh, registered with the Heart Start uh, school uh, programme, and we have got 150 uh, teachers being trained in uh, as Heart Start uh, instructors. Uh, and the uh, Heart Start programme, again, is about helping to build on that community resilience within um, our own individual uh, communities uh, itself. And the Community Responder Scheme uh, is an important element uh, to that. Plain officer, um, I do not underestimate the value um, of the Community First Responder Scheme. And as Hugh Henry rightly says, it is not a replacement uh, for uh, uh, paramedics from our ambulance service, but it is an additional support in order to make sure the individuals who may require uh, assistance and care uh, can receive that as early as possible. As a government, we intend to continue to build on that work in the coming years. And I again wish to offer my sincere thanks uh, and ongoing support to uh, those within the Community First Responder Scheme in Nielsen and Uplaw Moor. Many thanks. And I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30. Thank you all.